Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining us for the Art Platform Symposium. This will be uh, provided in simult with simultaneous interpretation between Japanese and English. Please confirm which language you are going to be using. If you have any questions, please use the chat function. And we look forward to having an active discussion. After the live streaming, you'll be able to see an archive version of today's proceedings on this channel. Please do not make any recording of any kind or any screen captures. We would now like to begin the Bungacho Art Platform Japan Symposium, drawing lessons from the Museum Ludwig Collection, vibrant interactions between the museum and the public. First of all, on behalf of the National Arts Centre, we would like to call upon the director, Eriko Osaka. Good afternoon. It's an extremely hot day, the final day of June. And from yesterday, we have started the Ludwig Museum exhibition, which focuses on the collection created by the citizens. We are very happy to be able to welcome Ilma Zuvio, the director of the Museum Ludwig, who has very kindly come to Japan. to coincide with the start of this exhibition. And it's the first time since I became a director in April of 2020 to be able to welcome a visitor from abroad. Today, the director will be looking at how the public collection was created by the citizens. So the overall title is Drawing Lessons from the Museum Ludwig Collection, Vibrant Interactions Between the Museum and the Public. We will also be having a, direct, a discussion with the director of the Mori Art Museum, Mami Kataoka, Peter and Elaine Ludwig are the couple who gave their name to the Museum Ludwig. It's um, supported by the city of Köln and the collection numbers 14,000. The degenerate art, as it was um, branded during the war, which is the avant-garde art was protected by citizens. We also understand that citizens have continued to support, to foster, and also to protect this collection and to continue to develop it. With the, together with the pandemic, there's also been the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We are really not certain about the future, about politics, about economy, and also our day-to-day -day lives. And I think it's extremely important that we have this opportunity to hear about museums, also about art, and how the ties are built with the citizens. Thank you very much indeed, Director Osaka. So we'd now like to begin the presentation. Today's speaker is the director of the Museum Ludwig, Irma Zuvio who was the director of the Hamburg Kunstkerein previously, and who has been the director of the Museum Ludwig in Cologne since February of 2015. And he was also the curator for the Venice Biennale, for the Australian Pavilion previously, and for this year for the German Pavilion. Dr. Zivia, please. Yes, indeed, it is hot. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, that you give me the opportunity to be here. I uh, would like to give a, a, a heartful thank uh, to Eriko Osaka. Thank you so much for um, being the uh, uh, host here and uh, for getting engaged uh, in this project. And I would like to congratulate uh, Yuko Ikeda, the chief curator 
of the National Museum of Modern Art in Kyoto, and Mitsuo Nagaya, Chief Curator of the National Art Center in Tokyo here, uh, for this uh, really strong exhibition uh, you curated um, out of um, our collection. Um, and uh, it was very nice for me to see uh, this presentation here and also very enlightening. So thank you very much. And I also, of course, would like to thank my dear colleague, uh, Kataoka Mami, for doing the, um, uh, the conversation with me now. It's really great uh, that uh, though we have a busy plan, a schedule, that you, that you take the time for this. I would like to uh, concentrate actually on um, uh, two aspects today, uh, talking about the uh, Museum Ludwig. Uh, one is the uh, civic commitment, uh, how our collection was built by uh, private collectors and, by, uh, and how it's still supported and still works are added to our collection by uh, members of the civic society. And I think that's something very interesting. But I learned here um, that this for Japan uh, is very interesting too, and maybe even could be a role model or something um, uh, uh, one is interested here very much. I would like to start with the first image. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I could imagine uh, not every one of you has been uh, to the Museum Ludwig, and not everyone has been to uh, the city of Cologne. So here you see uh, in the upper uh, left uh, image, uh, you see the Museum Ludwig in the front, um, and uh, you see right behind it, or right next to uh, the museum, is the Cologne Cathedral. So it's the monument, uh, uh, the national heritage in Cologne, and uh, it has uh, a lot of visitors. It's really in the center uh, of uh, Cologne. And also next to our museum, next to the Museum Ludwig, is the uh, main station, the railway station, and the River Rhine. So we're really, like, uh, literally in the center of the city. And we take this actually also um, as, a, as a metaphorical starting point for uh, our activities um, that we, uh, that is our aim, not only to be um, uh, physically in the center of the uh, society of Cologne, but that it is our aim to be really not only rooted, but have an influence and a conversation uh, between the citizen um, uh, of uh, Cologne. And here you see the um, uh, entrance hall. And I think um, if the name Museum Ludwig comes to, uh, if this comes to mind, to a lot of people then um, they think about the pop art because that is maybe um, uh, one of the uh, best known pop art collection in the world. At, uh, for sure, it's the biggest uh, pop art collection uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, and it was, uh, like many other parts of our collection, donated by Peter and Irene Ludwig when the museum was founded in 1976. So, as part of the donation they gave, uh, it was a mixture, mixture between donation and uh, long-term loans uh, in 1976. And a lot of the long-term loans became later than a uh, uh, donation. Like, for example, here with the Russian avant-garde, we have a, um, the uh, biggest uh, Russian avant-garde collection uh, outside uh, Russia. And uh, the, they also were collected by Peter and Irene Ludwig. Uh, and uh, talking about the current political uh, situation, in, uh, especially in, in Europe, and uh, talking about the war uh, the Russian starts with, the, uh, with Ukraine, uh, we actually now rethinking uh, if, how valid 
this term Russian avant-garde is, uh, because you see here uh, a key piece by uh, Malevich, uh, and he was born in Ukraine. So, um, and there are other uh, artists uh, in our so-called Russian avant-garde collection, uh, which, which are from Ukraine. So, um, but as we know uh, that every term, every art historical uh, term and every ism uh, is only, you know, it's, it, it, it's never really uh, uh, so much valid, but uh, here, especially in these current times. Then one um, uh, key point of our collection is the Picasso collection. And uh, not everyone knows that the Museum Ludwig, besides the monographic museums in Barcelona and in Paris, has the biggest collection of um, Pablo Picasso. And I guess you may wonder how, why, how this happened. And uh, uh, one reason is that uh, Peter and Irene Ludwig that they were also art historians. Uh, like uh, Peter Ludwig, um, uh, he also ran, an, one should have say, or should, could say, a chocolate imperium. He had like many chocolate factories and trading uh, chocolate uh, worldwide. And, um, but he was also an art historian, studied art history. That's where he met Irene Ludwig, his wife. And, uh, so he did his PhD in 1950 on Pablo Picasso. And already then he started acquiring works by Picasso. And uh, at a time, of course, it was already expensive, but uh, far away uh, from the current uh, prices. And he also continuously, over the decades, bought works by Picasso. Uh, and also in the uh, 1970s, for example, um, when the current paintings of Picasso in 1970, I remember, or, you know, you can read about the exhibition in Arl Picasso had, it was a total disaster. No one uh, liked, I mean, he got harsh criticism uh, for uh, the exhibition for, for his current paintings then in the 1970s, and no one wanted to buy them also. But Peter Ludwig really bought uh, not one, not two, but like really, uh, uh, even from this exhibition, uh, he bought uh, several uh, works. And these you see actually uh, in the lower, um, lower row uh, in the middle, uh, there you see uh, some three paintings uh, of, this, of this period. I mentioned that the Museum Ludwig was founded in 1976. This is correct, but it's also not really correct because our history, the history of the Museum Ludwig goes back far further um, because when uh, Peter Ludwig and Irene Ludwig, when they offer the city of Cologne their collection, uh, the only thing they asked for was a museum with their own name. Uh, uh, Ludwig Museum, Museum Ludwig, that's what they asked for. And the city of Cologne agreed and um, they um, developed a museum, Museum Ludwig, out of the 20th century collection of the Walraf Richards Museum, which so far would go back to medieval, to the uh, then contemporary. So they sort of like split the contemporary from the Walraf Richards Museum, joined it with the Museum Ludwig, or with the collection of Peter and Irene Ludwig, and made the Ludwig Museum Ludwig. And um, that means uh, already in the Walraf Richards Museum, there was a big collection donated 30 years earlier, right after World War II, uh, Josef Haubrich. He, a lawyer in Cologne, he donated a vast number of expressionism, um, uh, German expressionism, uh, to the city of Cologne. At that point then, the Museum Ludwig was not existing yet, to the Walraf Richards Museum. But this was then, uh, in 1976, merged together with the collection. And there are voices actually still up today uh, asking, you know, the museum should actually be called uh, Haubrich Ludwig Museum uh, because Haubrich was also like really, really uh, uh, important. 
and also, ah, sorry, that, that was actually what I wanted to show you, the express, uh, two examples of the expressness uh, uh, collection. And also um, a main holding of our collection is a vast photography collection starting with the beginning of uh, photography to the very contemporary. And there were also, um, there was one, uh, the Aqua Photohistorama, which was a museum on its own, which in the 80s then was merged, um, no, later actually, uh, in the two, uh, 2000, then was merged uh, with the Museum Ludwig. And uh, there was the uh, Fritz Gruber collection, uh, and his widow, Renate Gruber, is also still uh, very closely related and continued also after the, the death of Fritz Gruber to, to donate works to our collection photography works. So that's how we um, achieved to um, get this incredible uh, photography collection. Also part of the uh, Ludwig Foundation, you know when you uh, Ludwig um, collection, I think most of the people, if they hear Ludwig collection, they think about the pop art. And they think about the, one could say, the loud art, the art which speaks very um, uh, uh, loud, which is very um, popular, as the name pop art also says. But actually, uh, Peter and Irene Ludwig, uh, they had uh, great advisors, uh, gallerists, uh, friends, um, uh, like Wolfgang Hahn, for example, an important uh, conservator uh, in Cologne. Uh, uh, he, you know, they were in close contact and exchanged their opinions. So they also bought works uh, abstract uh, of abstract tendencies in Europe and the U.S. from the 50s um, and the um, uh, 60s. And you see here. Uh, Morris Lewis, uh, Mark Rothko, Donald Judd, Eva Hesse, and Lucio Fontana, just to mention a few. Uh, and I think some are surprised. I was actually surprised um, uh, when I dig deeper into it that Eva Hesse is also acquired uh, by um, uh, uh, Peter, Lud Peter and Irene Ludwig. So um, uh, as mentioned already, we, um, the museum uh, is built on private uh, collection. Uh, these were just uh, like the, some of the main collection. There are much more. Uh, there is the Pyle collection, for example, or uh, Lili Schnitzler, uh, who gave us uh, great works by Max Beckmann. Uh, so that's how the uh, collection came together. But up to now, we receive a lot of donation by private uh, collectors and uh, supporters. And we have two groups of friends. We have one, uh, which is called the Friends of the Walraf Richards Museum and Museum Ludwig. And this comes of the history I just told you, that the Museum Ludwig actually was, was merged with the 20th century of the Walraf Richards Museum. And the Walraf Richards Museum, of course, still exists, uh, but it stops at 20th century with the collection. So the Friends, uh, they, they continued then to support both institutions, the Walra Frischatz and the Museum Ludwig. And they have a vast number of members, 6,000 members uh, uh, to support uh, the museum. And they pay an annual uh, contribution of 60 euros each person per year. And uh, with this, they support our activities, our talks, um, but they also, uh, for us, are also very important because there's so many people and they, you know, spread the word, they talk about our institution. So on the one hand, it's an economical support, but uh, maybe even more important, uh, it's uh, uh, a social support. It's a, a support you can't pay, actually, it's so valuable. And then we have the Gesellschaft für moderne Kunst am Museum Ludwig. This was founded later in the 80s. Um, because uh, they, uh, a, a group of members um, uh, of the uh, 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 members of the society, they felt that they would like to get more engaged, that they would like to m support more the institution. But I guess also they wanted to have more a say. You know, wanted to one could say maybe influence would be too much. But you know, to be part of this uh, institution. 
And so the Gesellschaft für Moderne Kunst, they have 600 members, uh, and each member pays uh, around uh, 600 euros. And um, the, the budget they acquire with this, uh, they use to, um, they establish the Wolfgang Hahn Prize, a very prestigious uh, prize they uh, give once a year. And uh, with the prize, part of the prize is that a work by an artist who is not in the collection yet um, uh, can be, the work can be acquired for the collection by the Gesellschaft. So my talk also as a starting point for our conversation, I would like on the one hand the civic commitment, the engagement, and on the other hand um, a topic uh, I'm very concerned with um, which you could may call uh, the topic of diversity or uh, the topic of inclusion, of taking, making it possible, uh, of, of taking part in our program. And um, I think we, we're on a good way. There's still a long way uh, to go, and we may be, maybe never reach the, uh, what, 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 uh, the, the, final, <laughs> the final destination. But um, we, um, we really, that's an urge uh, for me, and I know also for a lot of members uh, of the teams. And I think we're doing quite well if we look at our uh, exhibition program. I would say we, and I show you later also examples, um, that we, um, uh, that is, is not so homogenetic. It's, it's very uh, uh, broad and going in different uh, cultural uh, directions. Uh, and also with the acquisition, we're on a, on a good way. Uh, but if I look, for example, at our team, uh, we are still, I mean, we also, there are also, the, uh, you know, changing development uh, is there taking place too. But naturally, that takes much more time uh, than, uh, you know, changing, working on the exhibition uh, program. And um, one exhib, oops, one, oh no. Oh, no, no, no. This. Um, uh, uh, one presentation uh, I would like to show you is a presentation uh, my colleague Barbara Engelbach uh, and uh, Janice Mitchell, who worked with the museum for two years, supported by the Terra Foundation. Uh, they both uh, worked on this presentation from our permanent uh, collection, which is still on, actually. and. Um, the, um, the, the presentation was like an exhibition, uh, and it had sort of like the title John Dewey Who. John Dewey, uh, uh, an American philosopher, um, and one of his key points uh, uh, is that he said that art not only comments politics, society, uh, but that art actually has an active influence in politics, in the way society is structured. And this exhibition, um, uh, Barbara Engelbach and Janice Mitchell, they uh, put together works from our uh, collection and uh, by contemporary artists, and they were in close contact with this artist, asked them uh, you know, if John Dewey was, had any relevance uh, for them. Uh, and this, the space you see here, there's one, uh, you see a piece by Gülsün Kara Mustafa, uh, an artist um, uh, born, as you can read here, in 46 in Ankara in Turkey, a piece we acquired uh, for our uh, collection, and already there the presentation of a really as pres representation. Uh, you see also the topic, it's a key piece, I would say, for this presentation. Um, uh, it is about cultural identity, uh, and also like the whole the whole presentation, I would say, deals with this uh, notion. John Dewey was also a, uh, a vivid and strong teacher, and he believed uh, in the power of teaching, teaching art. And uh, so we, uh, or my colleagues, asked the artists also, some of them uh, teach, and most of them went to an art school, what, what, arts, what, what does art school mean for them, and how, what, what is teaching, what, what meaning uh, has it? Um, and for me, really, this, this idea that art not only comments on society, but really has an influence on society, 
is something I'm very driven by. I really believe in this and that's also why uh, I work in this field and that's also uh, why with my colleagues um, we, we go in the direction uh, we go but because we really want to change something. You see uh, other works uh, here by Oscar Murillo. Um, uh, 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 we use um, uh, also as an activity place for uh, education and uh, uh, and and uh, more works, but now I would like come to to another exhibition. Actually, Janice Mitchell did as part of her Terra Foundation uh, program. Um, we asked uh, uh, Janice Mitchell to look at our collection uh, and to look at the strength of our collection. And you already by now know that the American part post-war. Um, uh, is uh, very strong in our collection. So we uh, ask her to look at our strengths, but also at our weakness uh, of the collection and um, see, uh, you know, what is missing. And um, to no surprise, because that goes for a lot of Western uh, museum, uh, we have a very uh, uh, male-dominated white western uh, dominated position in our uh, uh, collection and so Janice Mitchell she uh, um, uh, was also looking at this but tried to find other figures other artists uh, who uh, we all think um, are very important in this discourse if you want to call it an American uh, uh, discourse and uh, here you see a piece by uh, eight oh no that was, ah, that's it once. Here you see the piece by Adrian uh, Piper. Uh, we acquired actually also uh, later on, you know, when the show was on, it, we, uh, it, it was not in our collection yet, but then as part uh, and in conversation with Adrian Piper, uh, we acquired uh, this piece and actually also um, other works by her. This was the entrance uh, of the uh, uh, exhibition, and here you see a piece by Zenga Nengudi, um, uh, an African-American um, uh, artist. The water composition, uh, which is always produced new, but, but the concept goes back to 69 and 1907. And in the back, you see three black and white photographies. Uh, they are also by Zenga Nengudi, and uh, we acquired them uh, in advance of the exhibition because we knew we would do the exhibition and so uh, we acquired this uh, for our collection. And um, uh, here is a, a, a similar situation, it, uh, Louise Nevelson, um, an artist, uh, a, a, a famous piece uh, you see here uh, in, the, um, uh, in the back, Royal Tide. Uh, from the beginning of the 1960s. Um, a beautiful and iconic uh, piece by Louis Nevelson. And as part of uh, this exhibition, uh, we got a donation of the six collages you see here by Louis Nevelson, uh, which we presented there for the first, for the first time. And um, here you see a, um, a, a presentation um, a counterposition, uh, once more is Lewis, uh, and on the other hand, uh, Leon Polk Smith. And uh, I guess most of you uh, know uh, Morris Lewis, of course, um, strongly represented here also in the exhibition in Tokyo. Um, so most of you, and, and he sort of like being part of the canon uh, of this period, but I think that Leon Polk Smith should be uh, you know, is not less important. Uh, uh, and he uh, was an indigenous artist, and that is, of not of course, but that is, uh, uh, for many other reasons also, but that's the main reason, not visible, as visible as uh, uh, Morris Lewis. So when, um, um, uh, when we acquired this painting, also knowing uh, that we would do this uh, uh, exhibition, um, uh, and I'd like then, I didn't have this uh, juxtaposition in my mind, but I like when Janice Mitchell then did this uh, presentation because I think it really works. 
It really tells you how strong uh, the piece by Leon Paul Smith from the same period, from the same geographical, also living in New York uh, uh, area, uh, but having uh, much less visibility. And um, so uh, the current exhibition, actually, um, I, I wanted to show you uh, briefly uh, is um, by Isamu Noguchi. And of course, here, uh, he's uh, uh, much better known than uh, in Europe and especially uh, in uh, Germany. And um, Rita Kersting, the deputy director, curated it um, for the Museum uh, Ludwig. And it's a joint uh, curation um, uh, with the Hayward Gallery and with, uh, sorry, Barbican, uh, uh, Barbican Gallery and the um, uh, uh, Zentrum Paulkli in Bern. So all three curators uh, together con uh, did the concept and developed it. And um, so uh, when uh, Rita suggested, Rita Kassing suggested to do the show, um, I was very enthusiastic. On the one hand, uh, I myself a, a big fan of uh, Isamu uh, Noguchi, knowing him since my student days. But also in most recent time, uh, artist uh, really uh, talked a lot about his work to me and also to, to my colleague, uh, let's say Jan Vo, for example, um, uh, who really uh, did several shows together, uh, but also uh, Hegyu Yang or Minerva Crevas, um, uh, also all, uh, you know, they, they, they were mentioning him or referring in their uh, work. So, and um, I, uh, uh, you know, if we think uh, why Isamu Noguchi is not as uh, visible and not as part as the canon as other uh, American uh, sculpture of this time, um, I would say there are uh, several reasons, and one reason is um, his uh, sort of like cultural uh, identity. He was born uh, in Los Angeles by um, uh, uh, an American uh, mother and by a um, uh, Japanese uh, father, a poet who's well known here, so, um, and um, uh, lived uh, his early childhood in Los Angeles, but then came to Japan, his mother uh, took him to Japan. He, he spent a lot of time here um, uh, uh, up to his early adolescence. And then he went back to go to high school uh, in uh, the US. And if you read his text, um, uh, you, can, you can read that he felt really cultural, you know, like this question of belonging that was really a strong issue uh, for him. And um, I think that, that uh, was also one reason um, why he did not get all this attention like other uh, artists of him, because you could, it, it wasn't clear. Uh, was he an American artist? Was he a Japanese artist? Um, and um, uh, when he was living uh, in, in, in New York. And uh, another reason was, and this you see here in the middle, there is this table uh, next to the sculpture with the glass top. Uh, and that's, for example, in Germany, a lot of people know Isa Monoguchi, but they don't know that he's an artist. They think he's a designer uh, because of this table, which you find uh, quite regularly um, in homes in, in, in Cologne and in Germany in general. And um, this, this situation that he um, is, uh, you know, uh, also between these worlds, between the applied art and between um, uh, uh, the arts, uh, that also, I guess, was a reason. You know that he did work with uh, Martha Graham, that he did stage works. So he was hard to define. And that's something I like a lot, and I think that's something also Jan Vo or other younger artists like about him uh, and his strength and the, the beauty of his uh, uh, work. Uh, but that also, uh, I'm sure, was one reason why he has not the visibility, for sure, not in Germany and in Europe, like um, uh, artists uh, of his uh, generation uh, in the US. And we acquired uh, this piece for our uh, collection, uh, uh, play uh, sculpture, which I'm very happy. We haven't decided yet where we will 
uh, uh, put it, uh, hopefully outside, so that really uh, uh, children can interact uh, with this uh, sculpture. And we acquired this uh, uh, in, as part of the uh, exhibition. And this is uh, sort of like uh, the last image of the exhibition, very beautifully. I think Rita Kassing did a great job. Uh, that is a, a big hall, over nine meter high, um, where you see this piece he developed before man was flying to moon. Uh, so he had already the idea uh, that, you know, to communicate um, and to, to give a sign of, of uh, human beings on this planet. And, um, uh, and yeah, I really like this. Uh, this. It's one of the last spaces uh, of the exhibition. So I could have shown you uh, much more um, uh, exhibition examples um, uh, where, we, where we, I think, uh, broaden our scope and uh, uh, where we, with the awareness uh, that we are a Western uh, institution uh, in a way, but, but with the awareness um, that parallel uh, to the to the uh, artists we have in the collection, that there are very important voices uh, which are not represented in the canon, and uh, we for sure do not want to enlarge the canon. Uh, we do not want, but we want uh, to question it and to you know to have parallel movements uh, and to really discuss and show um, uh, voices which are not heard uh, uh, so far. And I, um, I end with some uh, acquisitions uh, we did in, in, in recent time to maybe give you an idea um, about, uh, you know, how we try to work with our collection and to enlarge it and to make it maybe more complex, uh, more uh, uh, actually what the reality was and is uh, than, than what our museum uh, shows. Um, uh, we acquired a piece by Marta Minuin. Uh, you see here, she was born 43 in Buenos Aires in Argentina. And I remember when I've seen this uh, uh, piece uh, in a group show, actually in Oquis at Haus der Kunst, uh, uh, a big group show. Uh, I've seen it and I've, I read on the label, uh, courtesy of the artist, I got very nervous and I thought, wow, uh, uh, this, this piece is not in a collection yet. Um, because uh, when I see this, and also when I've seen it there, uh, if I see this, this piece by Marta Menun, of course, and if you th see it was uh, in 62, uh, it was um, uh, uh, done. And uh, of course, I think of Robert Rauschenberg in our collection. And she was also for some time uh, in New York. And, and she was aware, she, one can't say she was part of the movement. So she knew Warhol and other uh, uh, people, but um, she worked, she developed work which I think fantastically uh, uh, are in a, could be in a dialogue with our, with our collection and as I now we have presented it next to uh, Rauschenberg uh, and it, it really makes sense, it really and it broadens the concept of uh, pop art or what pop art could be. Uh, a similar way, oops, a similar way maybe with uh, Teresa Burga uh, a painting from 66, which you can, uh, I think, uh, I do not have to say much, but if you, if you just formally look at the uh, work and, and, and uh, constantly, you know, what it represents every day. And so um, uh, we, we bought two paintings for our uh, collection and um, now it's part of our pop art collection and makes it maybe more uh, shows that that pop art is maybe something else than than we than we think it maybe is. Oops, what's that? It stopped. Hmm. Ah. Oops. Yeah. Um, uh, a, a piece here. You see only a detail. There are several um, uh, of these collages by uh, Neil Yalta. A uh, Turkish artist who lives since uh, the 60s in uh, Paris. Um, and uh, uh, Rita Kassing uh, did an uh, exhibition, a survey of her work at the Museum Ludwig. And um, uh, for me, this survey uh, was very important for several reasons. One, 
reason is for sure that uh, Neil Yalta is a fantastic artist. Uh, actually, the Berlin Biennale, uh, now it's uh, opened, uh, I think, uh, three or two or three weeks ago, um, starts with a piece by uh, Neil, Neil Yalta. Um, uh, and uh, so sh I, I was happy that, that we showed this fantastic artist. But I also, like the same with Gülsün Kara Mustafa, the piece we acquired, uh, I'm also aware uh, that Cologne, after Berlin, is the city um, with the uh, biggest uh, Turkish community in Germany. And um, uh, I, uh, for me, it was always clear that if you want to reach uh, uh, the Turkish community, uh, uh, they want to be reflected in our institution. You also go to museums. I mean, you want to discover new things. But you also, I think it's a natural thing that you want to be somehow reassured or that you want to find what, what your interest is in, uh, in the institution. Uh, and so I was very happy to do, you know, that Rita suggested the show, that she did the show at the Museum Ludwig. And, that, um, and it is really true. If you, if you do a show at the Museum Ludwig with a Turkish artist uh, and uh, you have more Turkish visitors. Uh, and uh, talking about you know uh, becoming more diverse as also as a as our community in the museum, um, I think uh, it's important. I, I end my presentation with an acquisition also uh, by uh, Neil Yalta, uh, a, a beautiful painting also from the 60s, uh, 1967. Um, we actually at the moment present also. Uh, at the uh, at the museum Ludwig, so um, uh, this um, I, uh, with this talk, and I, I would come to an end. Uh, I concentrated um, on on these uh, uh, two issues. On on the one hand, on the civic commitment, how, and I think it goes together. Uh, you know, if you um, uh, want to involve uh, uh, your community. Um, uh, then you have to question yourself: Who is your community, and um, uh, and how can you uh, engage them? And and um, and that is also part of the the the, the civic uh, uh, engagement. Uh, and uh, and then the topic of diversity. Uh, at least um, uh, two other main topics I didn't talk about uh, today, but I had to think about one topic today all the time uh, when I was walking through, um, uh, and since I'm here actually uh, walking through Tokyo, um, uh, is uh, uh, the ecological question. Uh, I mean, uh, that is something uh, our team is, uh, uh, myself, but also our team is uh, very concerned. And actually, the next show uh, will be um, about this, uh, and not only the topic, but also how the show is produced will reflect uh, sustainability. Uh, and that, that's something um, uh, the Museum Ludwig uh, is, uh, the, the team of the Museum Ludwig is very much uh, uh, concerned. Uh, and uh, which also goes together is the question of digitalization. You know, how, if we talk about community, what is this community? How broad is this community? Who do you can reach? Tonight is a good example. You know, we are online now. A lot of people in different time zones have the possibility, if they want, uh, to, to participate. Uh, and I think all these three, this... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, the diversity topic, uh, the sustainability, and the uh, digitalization uh, are three main points which really go uh, together and are important for uh, a, a museum uh, of the present, but maybe even more of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Zuivio. Now we'd like to have some discussion, dialogue. Moderator is the uh, chair of the National Contemporary Art Committee, uh, Ms. Katalka, please.
So thank you very much. It's been very interesting that uh, your talk stimulated my brain a little bit so that I have uh, pretty much ready to ask a number of questions. But um, the first of all, it's so nice to have you here. <laughs> and last time I was in Cologne, it was to see Hegu Yan's retrospective. Probably it was in 2019. So it's so nice to physically start meeting again. And uh, to, uh, to learn a little bit more about your museum and also the system, how uh, civic society could uh, commit to the museum, Maybe you could um, tell us a little bit about the museum system, particularly in Germany, and different models of the museums. Now, yes. Um, uh, yep, uh, the, the uh, art system uh, in Germany is uh, a quite special, one has to say. Uh, and uh, because we have uh, mainly three different types uh, of institution. There is the Kunstverein, uh, which is a member club, uh, and there are several hundreds uh, in Germany, and their history goes back to the Enlightenment movement to 19th century when they were um, uh, initiated and, and um, uh, to educate actually uh, the people and to, to also empower, you could say, uh, the, the civic society uh, by dealing with uh, with art and culture in general, uh, so this is the the Kunstverein, and then the um, uh, another uh, form of institution, and that is what the uh, NACT is. Uh, it's a Kunsthalle, uh, that is an institution with no collection, um, uh, uh, and in relation to a Kunstverein, uh, doing more maybe established uh, uh, artist, and then there is the museum which has a collection, uh, and uh, quite often uh, the museums were developed out of the Kunstverein. Uh, so for example, in Hamburg, it was first the Kunstverein. Uh, so the people would meet in these gatherings with the Kunstverein and also collectors. And then at one point they would decide, oh, let's join our collections and build a museum. That was in Hamburg the case. So, and but it's still, all these three forms still existing, what makes it a bit more complicated by now is that as contemporary art became so popular, uh, museums uh, quite often do very similar programs uh, in Germany than you would may expect from a Kunsthalle or from a Kunstverein. And not only the program, but also they take over structures, that, like they have members, I mentioned the Museum Ludwig also has actually two member clubs. Um, so there are members, that was formerly like the, the point, uh, you know, for uh, Kunstvereine, and also other activities like lectures, educating, that's how the Kunstvereine started and that what still makes them strong. Um, so the, the, it, it became more complicated, intermingles or uh, it overlaps the activities, but still now, Usually the Kunstverein, they do a much more, it's expected that they do a much more advanced program uh, than a Kunsthalle or a museum. And Kunstverein often uh, translated as uh, artist association. So the members are mostly artists? Not necessarily, actually. Ah, okay. Some okay. are initiated by artists, but mm -hmm. not all. Not uh, ah, okay. Uh, and uh, actually, it's, uh, I remember in Hamburg, uh, it was always uh, the aim uh, you know, of the board, let's say there's a board of nine people, oh, we have at least one artist in the board. Mm. So you see, I mean, mm. it, it changed. It's really a, um, um, that, uh, yeah, peop people uh, get engaged, not necessarily mm. uh, artists. I see. And uh, in terms of Museum Ludwig, which is the city museum of Cologne, so, uh, yeah, maybe just to try to understand, yeah, I was looking at... Uh, uh, scale of the city of the Cologne, which is a little over one million. And if you count larger Cologne, it's 3.5 million. But the, your basic funding comes from city of Cologne, which is composed of this one million? Absolutely, yeah. The, the, uh, the basic funding comes uh, from the city, from, from politics, one has to say, you know, like uh, tax money hmm. uh, we, we receive. And it's... Uh, 
uh, our budget, we uh, from the 100% budget, uh, two third uh, we get from the city, and one third we have to raise ourselves mm. uh, by ticketing, by our support groups, by sponsoring, uh, by different things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it's because the museum Ludwig is quite big. And uh, also maintaining this large number of collection is uh, not inexpensive. So thinking about this tax revenue from one million city, which I was trying to compare with some of the cities in Japan, and uh, actually museum in Kanazawa, it's a city museum, and they have half a million population. And then also a city like Kyoto is 1.5. So somewhere between Kyoto and uh, Kanazawa, but the city level, city uh, government to run that scale and also the quality of the museum, like the Museum Lut Ludwig, is quite a dedication already. It is, but uh, we can, it's public, the concrete uh, figures. Uh, we um, have a budget about, uh, a very small budget. I mean, if I talk to American colleagues, they say, how can you do what you do with this small <laughs> amount of uh, budget? Uh, it's uh, 13 millions, one, three, 13 millions. 13. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. so it's really very few, and uh, but this mainly all goes uh, to uh, the, 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 the wages, to the building, to so uh, our program, uh, more or less, we have to raise ourselves. I see, I see, so, I see. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting. And uh, also uh, thinking about this, the collection started to be a uh, like seed for the new museum. And uh, um, yeah, I was trying to find out the reason why these major collectors, uh, Ludwig and uh, the, the other collector, uh, was it particular about the colonial line land, there is the custom to become a, like once you make a fortune, you become a collector, or is it more like a German culture already sort of uh, embraced, or what do you think? I think there's a history going back, and that goes for uh, uh, definitely for Germany uh, and also maybe other European countries. There's a history, uh, as I mentioned, with the Kunstvereine, so. Um, and, uh, and I think if you ask why Peter and Irene Ludwig or why Josef Haubrich uh, donated uh, their collection to the city, uh, there were several and complex reasons, of course, for this. Um, uh, one reason, uh, I guess, was also to make sense with, with your life, you know, what, what, what stays if, if one is not there anymore, if one dies. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was a, um, a, a question of legacy. Uh, for sure, and it's also like Peter and Irene Ludwig did not have uh, children, uh, mm -hmm. so um, uh, I guess that that maybe was. But but this idea of legacy, I think, uh, is very important. And it's interesting that um, Peter Ludwig said uh, when you would ask him why he did it, he said, you know, he never collect. They, they uh, um, uh, Irene Ludwig and Peter Ludwig, uh, he said. They, they would never collect for themselves, but for the public. Mm. That's what he said. That was his initial aim, mm. uh, to collect uh, for, the, for the public. And he also refers to Josef Haubrich. He, uh, in one of his interviews, he says that he, as a young student, mm. has seen uh, the presentation of the donation Haubrich did to the city of Cologne uh, in um, uh, uh, for the... 46, he has seen it, and he was so touched and overwhelmed um, and uh, by this. And also Haubrich at the time said he donates the collection because he wanted to educate the young people mm. who in the last uh, years uh, under the Nazi regime mm -hmm. uh, would not have seen this art. Mm -hmm. Uh, because he collected, mm. as, you, as I've shown, expressionism, mm. which was by the Nazis mm. uh, termed as degenerated and was destroyed. So he really had a, had a mission, uh, already Haubrich and, and um, uh, Ludwig, the Ludwigs also, they, they, were, uh, they, they wanted also to educate. And Ludwig also said that he had this um, encyclopedic idea of art. So he was not only, he actually started with collecting medieval books, 
uh, miniatures and uh, antiques, and so he, he had a vast uh, 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 aim. Mm. And um, and there is a quote actually by him where he says he would love to uh, uh, to collect art from India. Um, mm. from uh, Asia, and he said this already in the 1970s. Wow. So before uh, what we now term globalization like, or global mm, art, mm. Uh, he had already, and that's actually why the museum Ludwig has uh, Cuban art uh, mm. already early, like Cacho uh, mm. we have in our collection, or why we have uh, certain Chinese artists, uh, like uh, Fang Li Yong, uh, we have um, uh, Wan Yongping, Sai Go Chang, all in our collection from early on. Mm. Um, and that uh, for sure was his, his vision. And I say his because he was always the one who talked, uh, typically maybe, uh, also for this generation. Uh, but we know that Irene Ludwig uh, was very important, that she was really a driving force. Also, she would not want to be in the limelight, uh, but she really, uh, uh, you can tell how important she uh, was uh, for the collection also. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I was just about to ask um, for the historical background of the Nazi time and why those <coughs> the people went to collecting art, like avant-garde art, because uh, the Peter and Elena was born in 1920s, so they must have gone through in their youth the time that all this avant-garde art was prohibited. Absolutely, and and I mean there is also a complicated history with uh, as, as a as a uh, very young adult uh, or like with fifteen or uh, sixteen, uh, 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 Peter Ludwig was part. You know, he was uh, or even younger. He was part of the uh, of of the regime somehow. Mm. I mean, as mm -hmm. as a lot of people were, mm. um, and uh, but for example, Josef Haubrich really. Uh, uh, wanted to save the art. He mm. had a, 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 Jew, a, a wife, a Jewish wife, who mm. killed herself mm. uh, in this period, um, and he uh, he saved the works. Uh, and it's it's very, I think, uh, very complicated if you look at the history of our institution and if you look at the history of the Vara Frischatz Museum. Um, there was one director who for sure was a Nazi. I mean, he did exhibitions uh, with uh, topics. and he, But at the same time, he was a fan of expressionism. Mm. And uh, so he helped Haubrich, actually, uh, uh, to, to uh, save some of the artwork. Uh, and that was also the reason why after the war, there was a continuation. He still was then the director though he he did really um, positioned himself like mm. really awful, like mm. clearly as a Nazi. Mm. So life is difficult. But I think it's quite, quite interesting to feel this sense of the mission to the public. As you said, that they didn't uh, start collecting the works for themselves, it's more for the public. And it really reminds me of some of the Japanese businessmen who made a fortune before and after the war. And part, um, the one, one person called Mr. Matsukata, who collected all these impressionists and other collections of that time in Europe, and then those works were taken by France after the war, but then uh, it, part of it returned, and then now it bec became a National Museum of Western Art. Yeah, there's and now the exhibition, as we all know, right? Yes, Here, uh, yes. so this. there's exchange yeah. between uh, German museums, right? And uh, also, uh, Ohala Museum, which started in 1930, and also was started by the collection of the businessman, and uh, currently called the uh, Artisan Museum, but initially it's called the Bridgestone Museum, it's famous tire company. The owner started the collection in, and then opens the museum just uh, uh, 70 years ago, so 1952 they opened. So all of them, that generation had sense of mission they have to do something for the public and then also to educate and bring uh, high quality art from west to this country to really try to sort of uh, help modernizing this nation 
after modernization and also post-war time and how to recover. So all that kind of sense to do something for the society is really beginning what we, you talked about, the civic commitment. Yeah, I'm totally with you, and I think that's that's really uh, important. But I think we also should be, or you know, I should be um, aware uh, that uh, not to idolize these people. Mm -hmm. It was also about vanity. Everyone is vain, you know. It was also uh, about themselves. It was also about uh, getting influence. It mm -hmm. was also about uh, having a voice, uh, being heard, um, which is fair enough, I think. So, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, yeah, yes, it was about educating. But it was also about, you know, being there mm. uh, and, and being visible. Mm. And is it um, common to ask uh, muse like once you want to uh, donate the whole collection, uh, asking your name to be on a museum? Yes, it is. I mean, we have in Germany uh, several, like uh, a museum I like a lot is the Brandhorst Museum in Munich. Uh, that's the name. I mean, there's there are a lot Borda Museum. Mm. Uh, there, there are a lot of uh, museums, but we have it here as well. The institution you're working for has a private name, and of course, there is the history in the U.S. Right, the Guggenheim. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All. Yeah. Uh, uh, there, 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 there is a history about mm. this. And uh, yeah, I also wanted to ask about the particularity of the Rhineland. Is it different from other regions in Germany? or this kind of a model of collector donating a whole collection to the city and then making a museum. Is this some other example that you see in neighboring countries like Belgium or Netherlands? Or uh, that is interesting. Uh, uh, yes, you see it uh, uh, in, in, in Belgium and the Netherlands, but maybe not as uh, strong. But they are private, and they become more and more. And, and we have it in China. Uh, of course, yes. uh, at the moment, <laughs> uh, all these uh, private museums. But in the Rhineland, one can really say there, there is a tradition uh, about, I mean, you're just, I mean, these are extreme examples. If you think about Haubrich and if you think about uh, the Ludwigs, um, because they really made a change, they, 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 the, their collection is so important that they donated it. Um, but uh, in the Rhineland has a, a strong history. Uh, in the 60s, um, about like the the first art fair was mm, established yeah. there. Um, so a, a lot of collectors, and but then there was a a, a, dia a dialogue between Belgium also. Uh, a lot of Belgium collector would come to the fair and still come uh, in Cologne. Uh, so yes, the region is strong uh, uh, in uh, in art. Mm. Also, yeah, this year we had uh, a collection exhibition from uh, Fisher Collection, Minimalism and Conceptualism. And uh, so it's kind of like in a neighborhood, in a way, that all this new movement of post-war art emerged from that region. Absolutely, and he was a, a, a gallerist, um, and his wife then took later mm -hmm. over the, the gallery also. Uh, Konrad Fischer, first an artist, and then again specialized in conceptual art, and uh, yeah, it's and it's great, and and the, but uh, part of the collection, if my memory is correct, was bought uh, also uh, by the state of Northern Westphalia mm -hmm. uh, for the museum uh, K20. Mm -hmm. So that's state museum, right? That's yes, the the state of Northern Westphalia. Mm -hmm. Is there a state museum in Rhineland? Yeah, that, that that is in Düsseldorf. That is the but oh, but okay, not okay. Uh, um, uh, for example uh, uh, the state of Germany has um, uh, uh, two institution. Um, they're not museum but Kunsthalle, Bundeskunsthalle. Mm, in, that's in, like a national, like federal government. Yes, the national mm. federal the, in in Bonn and the Gropius uh, Bau in Berlin. Mm, mm, These mm. are federal um, institution Kunsthallen who present uh, 20th century and also sometimes uh, older art. Yeah. Mm. Um, can I go back to your collection just to try to have a scale, the idea of the scale, if you know the number of entire collection and uh, what percentage is coming from uh, initial to collections? That's very interesting. The, um, uh, we in 2016, uh, we published a catalog, Raisonné, 
um, on uh, our collection, a book actually. You know, I was talking about digitalization, and we we, uh, we try to do <laughs> we a lot. We still love paper paper book. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I really I think books. I, I adore books. Uh, so we published a, di uh, a quite a big um, catalog resume of the collection, but only uh, otherwise it wouldn't be possible as a printed uh, book. Uh, only painting, sculpture, installation, uh, film, uh, and a few photos. Uh, and they are uh, uh, a number of uh, 3,500, uh, which are all uh, in this book uh, with uh, uh, images. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so um, this is maybe what our audience knows the best, mm -hmm. these works. Mm -hmm. but. There are uh, 70, 70,000 70, uh, photography uh, works and 15, 15,000 works on paper uh, in our collection. So it's really a vast amount. Uh, and um, I, in, in, in this um, uh, context, only the 3,500 uh, of painting, sculpture, installation. I was looking, because I was also driven by this question, how much comes from the Ludwig? Uh, because we, our name is Ludwig. And uh, it uh, was a third, interesting Third. Enough. So, I mean, maybe not so much, one could say. Um, it is a lot, uh, but uh, that means uh, two other third uh, came in different ways. Like mm. we have an acquisition budget, of um, we get um, uh, 500,000 euros by the Ludwig Foundation um, with the um, uh, obligation by the city that they have to match it. Hmm. So we have okay. one million uh, 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 budget, but uh, we have to negotiate also uh, from time to time with the Ludwig Foundation hmm. to keep it uh, hmm. this this uh, amount of money. It doesn't. It isn't take for granted. It's the contracts are always for uh, three years. Sometimes for mm. one year. It, it depends. Um, and uh, so that for some people that sounds a lot, but you know, it's it's nothing. If you we we can't afford a Gerhard Richter or we can't afford even younger artists. So many younger artists we can't afford because they cost millions already yes, or yes. five hundred thousand or so. So uh, it's, uh, it's a, a substantial amount for a German mm. museum. Mm. Um, for example, Düsseldorf, which is a state, uh, not only a failure state museum, has two millions. Mm. Uh, as a, but there are uh, German museums who have no acquisition budget mm. at all. So um, there is the acquisition budget, but then there, there are the, um, the friends, the supporter who acquire. And then there is, uh, with the Gesellschaft für Moderne Kunst, there are uh, part of this uh, is uh, different groups. There is the Young Acquisition Group who acquire works for us. Mm. Then there is a group, I like the name a lot, they called Pearl Seeker, looking for pearls. <laughs> uh, they are uh, specialized on works on paper. They acquire works on paper. Um, so there are, there are uh, different groups um, helping us uh, mm. also uh, acquire. In addition to your one uh, million. But, uh, right. And, mm. and we, we receive a lot of donations also. Mm. We Actually, we also decline a lot of donations because every donation we receive costs us money uh, because we have to uh, put it in the storage. You know, we exactly. have, our conservators have to take care of it. Mm. Our whole team, if something comes into our house and we never sell anything mm. uh, in Germany, uh, if something, it stays there forever and it first makes a lot of work. And work means then in the end budget and, mm. and time. Mm -hmm. So we we very selectable what we, um, mm. what we accept mm. as a, a donation also. Yeah, I understand that receiving donation is not as simple as you think. But do you have a... The, the, the committee for acquisition and how the crew decides what to buy and also what to be received. 
Yeah. Uh, in the end, it's uh, the responsibility of the director. So it's my uh, responsibility. Uh, uh, but I see ourselves as a team. So the curatorial team, um, uh, they uh, suggest, and it's very seldom, I mean, I can't remember actually that I had to say no or something, because they're very informed. Uh, but in the end, it's my responsibility. And hmm. we don't have an a a acquisition uh, committee. I see. External acquisition yeah, committee. We, we talk with the colleagues in the house. I see. I see, uh, yeah. I see. But do you uh, kind of uh, build up this acquisition policy for the longer term future, as you mentioned about diversity? So how do you diversify your existing collection? Absolutely. That's that's what we, we really think. Uh, also, if we want to acquire and also if we get donation, we really think, uh, do we really need this? Uh, do we need another uh, great artist who is already in our collection? Hmm. Uh, isn't it maybe, for example, we do not have a David Hammonds and we can't afford, obviously, uh, one. But that is, uh, um, uh, we, we actively looking for, mm -hmm. uh, we approach um, collectors uh, to, you know, uh, if we know they have something in their collection and, and we, we try to convince them, uh, it would be great if this piece would come to the collection of the I Museum see, Ludwig. And we don't take loans, mm. uh, but only because we, our collection is already so big. And for every loan we would take, we would have to take something else in the storage. Mm. Mm. Uh, so that's why we, um, uh, 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 as, a, as a policy, we don't mm. take loans, but only uh, donations. Mm. We make an exception with uh, the friends, uh, officially, they give it as a loan of the Gesellschaft für Moderne Kunst, but it as part of the legal structure that if they would stop to exist, automatically this collection would come then to the collection of the Museum Ludwig, which means to the city of Cologne. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there was actually a question coming from the audience uh, in advance to the talk. And one of the questions was actually about the storage space. And if you have a storage space in the museum or when we expand the storage space, how do you deal with it? And also, yeah, I think it's a common question for every museum. And how do you want to expand the collection, but how do we do this storage? Right, and it's, it's also combined with an ecological question, right? Exactly. Or the sustainability yeah. question. Um, and uh, our storage is full. <laughs> We have uh, uh, we had already now to rent an external mm. uh, storage, and uh, we're talking with the politics, and they they're working also on it uh, uh, that to get with several uh, Cologne museums, uh, we get a main storage, uh, but this will take like realistically maybe a, a, at least another five years, if not seven, six, or eight. Uh, so, uh, but. Uh, we can't wait that long, so we have already uh, an interim uh, storage we share with uh, two other uh, Cologne museums mm. who have the same mm. problem. Mm. Uh, but the main aim, and we're actively working on this with the colleagues from the other museum also, uh, to get a, uh, a storage. And of course, there's also the question, how could this storage look, right? Could this be a storage you can walk in as yeah. a visitor? Yeah. Uh, how how visible can it be mm. and how major? But this is these are uh, questions uh, we we still working on. I mean, first of all, we had to have this interim uh, storage to uh, to make possible to you know to keep the collection. Yeah, I think some of the newer museums like M Plus is uh, making some part of the collection visible to the public. And some of the examples that I found in the European museums, like open, open storage, that's one way of uh, not displaying, but showing, and then still keeping it in a storage. Yeah, Rotterdam in Amsterdam is the oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. most current spectacular mm. uh, uh, building, yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's a huge question for every museum professional that we are all facing. And uh, the other question we have is the education. We talked a little bit about uh, the education, but uh, to continue nurturing uh, future supporter and future collector, I think uh, it's inevitable really to uh, have a connection with the uh, the children, the younger generation in the community. So how do you encourage that part? 
Uh, absolute outreach is a is an urgent question, but but we still have to do a lot. Uh, we have uh, not enough colleagues uh, because we share um, actually the education department. We share with all museums in ah, Cologne, I see. Uh, which could be positive, and it has some positive aspects. But in the end, it means we have one person working only for us, and the others are all freelance. I see. I see. And um, uh, and that is a challenge. And we we got, for example, through a special grant. Uh, a younger colleague who worked then for us uh, uh, for two years with this grant, but that's a constant uh, challenge to uh, be because uh, we are aware that you have to get uh, children in a young age, especially uh, if you want uh, to to address uh, uh, people who not usually go to the museum who um, come from different social backgrounds. And that's really uh, uh, an urgent uh, aim for us. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's, that's, a, that's a big challenge we're working on. Mm. And sometimes maybe not only younger generation, but recently we have new art lovers uh, from uh, entrepreneur or like business world, but Sometimes there are different kind of art, I would say. Um, it's hard to explain, but uh, the works becomes popular in the market. It's not necessarily the works that the museums or biennales are looking at, because a lot of our works reflect the social political complexity of the world at the moment. And then we want that kind of artistic value, but it's not necessarily always the same case in the market. But uh, they are, the new audience is interested in contemporary art. Do you see that some similarity in Germany? Absolutely, absolutely. That's, uh, I think, a global phenomenon that um, uh, and I'm especially interested in what you said, you know, I totally agree uh, that there, there is actually really uh, a split uh, almost, uh, and you can tell um, by what's what's been shown at the Biennial or, or like recent uh, current Documenta, um, and Documenta opened, I think, quite deliberately at the same date when Art Basel, the mm. most important art fair was. Uh, and they could do so because almost none of their artists uh, is shown at the galleries. Uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but really like 90% uh, are not shown in, at the galleries uh, in Basel. So I, t I absolutely see this, and, and it started early, I, I, I guess, um, uh, already in the 90s, there were certain artists then who, who became really like the YBA phenomena. They are great mm -hmm. artists, part of it, but there are some, uh, I, I guess, like someone like Damien Hirst, for example, um, uh, you very seldom find articles, let's say, in Art Forum or in October magazine or so about his work. Uh, if he appears there, uh, then it's about his market value and market strategy. Exactly. Exactly. And this this development, I, I, I see. And, but it's interesting, how do we deal as an institution with this? Mm -hmm. And how uh, do we make it possible that these people who have in general... Um, uh, an interest in art uh, for maybe different reasons, uh, how can we uh, engage them also to support what we do at the museum? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think it's in a way challenging but interesting moment that we are looking at uh, contemporary art from a whole different part of the world, but also the value system of contemporary art has really... Uh, developed or diversified so that now we are looking at uh, sort of more, maybe used to be called folk art or more crafts, are really coming into uh, contemporary art. And uh, of, of course there is whole new digital meg, uh, metaverse that what's happening in the digital realm. So we have to deal with a lot, but also uh, the museum needs to also question the physical experience in the space too. I think we, we all experienced this during the pandemic time. Yeah. When, <clears throat> when we were all sitting in front of the mm. uh, computer and also uh, did studio visits on the computer and, <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and how much was missing 
uh, then, and and that's something. And uh, and I guess that's also why people really come back to the museum. Mm. Uh, they uh, because um, the museum, on the one hand, you experience the artwork. It, I mean, if you see a Mark Rothko, you have to stand in front of it to exactly. experience it. You can't see it in an image, and you can't see it. Um, uh, in the computer and on the other hand the museum is a social space very often you go with friends or you go to openings and you exchange and um, so it's a social space uh, in the sense of uh, that it is about social issues but it's also you as a visitor uh, is a social being in this space and mm. it's different to be in this space or to be uh, online mm. yeah, it's another way of uh, civic commitment and then they feel that they belongs, the museum belongs to them and uh, they can come in at any time, that this kind of, uh, the sense of belongings. Absolutely, we see this, we have uh, once a month, the first Thursday of the month, uh, we have a, a special program, the entrance is free uh, and uh, you can see that the audience is quite different then. So, uh, because we, we uh, and it becomes much more a social space. Hmm. Uh, and it's not only about that it's free, that's one point, uh, but it's also the activities we do. You know, we have uh, people from different uh, backgrounds, or um, uh, there are also workshops, and, and it, really, hmm. it, it really works. Yeah, you were talking about the uh, Turkish community in Cologne, and which is a quite interesting question, that uh, quite, quite often the museum is said that uh, only people who has a certain income could come in, and uh, yeah, by making one free day is also one way of doing it. But I think it's just something to, to diversify our audience commitment, that, that's something that probably a museum could develop a little bit more. Yeah, I think ticketing is a crucial point. Uh, uh, one is uh, the money, but one is also the time. Hmm. You know, you have to uh, have a certain leisure time, uh, and in certain jobs you may have less leisure time than in other jobs, so, yeah. Yeah, also museum is a good place to escape from the heat as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just looking at uh, the time and we have nine minutes left and there's no question from the online audience, but if there is any question from the, the real space <laughs> visitor, yes, please. Uh, maybe Ismail, you want to get your... Yeah, thank you very much for your very interesting lecture and uh, uh, conversation with Mami Kataoka. And I'd like to ask about the uh, Art Foundation, Kunststifting of, of the museum. Uh, I, uh, I heard that uh, the uh, Art Foundation uh, helps uh, collectors to donate their artworks to the museum. Ne? And could you tell me, uh, could you talk about the function and uh, role in your museum? Yeah, it, um, it's a, a foundation um, actually initiated by uh, Kaspar König, my predecessor, but before uh, predecessor, and um, uh, it uh, actually uh, enables a collector, if uh, they donate something, uh, they have a better uh, tax benefit. Uh, that is this, uh, and by this um, situation, um, uh, we receive, for example, um, uh, vast numbers of works. I mean, it's a bit like the U.S. model, uh, which is in Germany not working. You know, if you donate, you get like only a very, very small percentage for your you can you, for your tax. But with this foundation, um, it's different. You have more. Uh, still, one has to keep in mind that, uh, for example, we received uh, uh, by. Um, uh, Ulrich Reininghaus and Anna Friebe Reininghaus, we received um, all editions by Sigma Polke. Uh, so uh, a, a, a valuable and big uh, collection. And yes, they could reduce, they got a better tax reduction um, through the foundation. Uh, but if they wanted really to make money with this, they would have se sell it. So um, it's only a stimulus. It's not usually uh, people, that's another um, uh, yeah, a trigger or another, uh, you know, another 
way uh, people, you know, I mean, the, the, the main thing is they have to be convinced that it's good for the, you know, it's good to do it. And then in, in addition, on top of it, if they see, oh, I can even save a little bit of money, uh, in I mean, not as much as I would sell it, then I would earn more money, but um, a certain amount. And, um, uh, and that's why we also, uh, it became more easy also to be get bigger quantities and more valuable work uh, uh, in our collection. But that's only one, uh, uh, one thing. And we also established uh, the International Society, which is the um, uh, American Friends uh, of the Museum Ludwig. Uh, and uh, this was also only possible because we worked with the King Bowden Foundation together, like some other European museum also do, um, because American collectors are used to, uh, if they, they donate something, that they, of course, can have a tax reduction. Um, and uh, so uh, with this international society, we also, uh, our aim is to get also more uh, works donated. Still, you have to screen the works, right? Absolutely, the, the yeah, we have side. actively... So uh, even they approach. wanted to... We, yeah, we receive a lot of, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, uh, questions for donations, uh, but we uh, we only say, and we as the curatorial team, we say we only uh, uh, take something we, we really would actively want to acquire. Hmm. Hmm. Do you have any sense of percentage if... 100 works try to be donated, how much would you take? Or maybe it just depends on the work itself. It really depends on the work, yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah. And it's also not that much we can get offered, <laughs> but, but we, the, we get a lot of offers, mm. um, especially by people who maybe, um, you know, they, they inherited their uh, yeah, yeah, collection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And let's say there is this movement of informal uh, uh, post-war uh, art. We have a very good oh. informal uh, collection. Actually, since I'm there, I, I think I received uh, uh, quite a lot of approaches. Oh, we could uh, donate this, but then I said, oh, I'm sorry, but we have already, so, uh, yeah. Somebody over there? Okay, so this is the one that I have Um, hello, my name is Martin German. I'm also living in Cologne, but now I'm working here at the moment in Tokyo for the, together with Mami at the museum. And I found it very interesting what you said about uh, the way how you, on the one hand, want to respect the canon, but then that you want to kind of create parallel narrations. And if we look, for example, what's going on at Documenta now or something, I'm asking myself, how do you do that exactly and how do you deal with value? Is there still kind of value or because some parallel narrations also want, wanted to question the canon? This is also structurally, I'm interested in how you do that also in thinking about the future. Also because I think in Japan things like canon are very important. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, it makes me clear that I wasn't clear <laughs> because um, uh, uh, we really do not want to respect the canon. Uh, the canon is there. It's something you can't deny. Um, uh, uh, maybe I, I was not clear. I wanted to say uh, that we are aware of the canon, but by including uh, parallel voices and parallel uh, uh, movements, uh, we don't want to say, ah, the canon is this but we really want to question, in general, um, uh, the canon. And the uh, uh, question of uh, value is a very interesting question, I think. What, what value are we talking about, right? I was mentioning that we, um, I think for me, David Hammonds is very valuable for our collection, but I'm not talking about an economic value, but, but like because we have so many of his contemporaries, but we don't have his uh, work. At the, same pri at the same time, we all know David Hammonds is incredible, the work is incredibly expensive. So sometimes the, uh, it over overlaps, the, um, uh, the aesthetic or um, uh, cultural value and the market value, but very often it doesn't, which is interesting. For example, 
uh, we uh, Mata Minuin was was a lot of money for us, but comparable to Rauschenberg or uh, to other people of this time, uh, it it had a, a, a much lower economical value. But for us, our the cultural value uh, is uh, extremely high, and that sometimes uh, you have to. Uh, I would say one has to do a lot of research. Um, uh, we acquired uh, Maria Mark, for example, uh, which is also here in the exhibition, uh, a beautiful, strong painting. It, it was in no relation to the prices of her husband, uh, Franz Mark. Um, so, but uh, for us at the museum, it has the same cultural value because it's from the time, it's a strong uh, piece, uh, and it's a position uh, neglected, and we know why, the, we know the structural social reasons why it was neglected. So I think um, the the question of value is super super interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's almost the time. But just I wanted to ask one last question about uh, your young patron that you mentioned. Yeah, because I'm really interested in the sustainability of the museum and also sustainable development of the museum and then the collection and uh, relationship with the civics. And it's really important to continue learning together with general public, but also the younger generation who is willing to be next Ludwig. Absolutely, that's a, but that's a big aim, right? How to, and I don't have an answer to this. Uh, but um, I, uh, uh, I, I mean, it's a bit cliche, but uh, uh, I see I, I, it's it's real. In if I look at our uh, at, at my colleagues, um, uh, the younger uh, colleagues are for for them is uh, the question of diversity of sustainability is really. Uh, crucial, or there is a certain uh, even anxiety, or a certain uh, uh, yeah drive behind it. Um, f like the people my generation, they also have it at the museum. Um, but uh, and and I personally also feel this urge. But I can see that that for example the the topic of sustainability. Of course, I'm aware of this. But my colleague Miriam Zwast, for example, she's the um, uh, curator of photography, but also since a year now, she also has the title uh, curator of sustainability because she, out of a personal motivation, uh, is a strong force in our team uh, to push this topic. And um, and we have a, a group of uh, colleagues in the team who voluntarily uh, join her and, and we have um, also part of it, we have meetings, uh, very often online meetings, you know, to discuss, and and we we, we took actions already, only small <laughs> actions, uh, uh, but but we uh, we are active in this, and uh, there are also uh, a lot of the younger colleagues uh, are uh, participating and pushing actually also the institution. So uh, yeah, you might meet future Ludwig or group of people who would continue supporting. Thank you very much, Ismail, thank you. and uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, Mr. Zuivio and Ms. Kataoka, thank you very much. With this, we would like to close the meeting. We have two simultaneous interpreters, Ms. Kayoko Yokoyama and Ms. Yuri Kitayama. And today, uh, the, uh, Provincia, in charge of the uh, contemporary art uh, video work, uh, did the uh, broadcasting and the uh, recording. And would like to thank all the people who contributed to this program today. And I also want to thank the audience uh, for their patience. Thank you. <laughs>